Spirit made a place for you where everything is new. Love has made a place for you where everything is new. Love has made a place for you where everything is new. Love has made a place for you where everything is new. Grace has made a place for you where everything is new. Grace has made a place for you where everything is new. has made a place for you where everything is new. Spirit made grace has made a place Spirits made a place for you where everything is new. I will be your standing stone, I will stand by you, I will be your standing stone, I will stand by you, I will be standing stone, I will stand by you. I will be your standing stone, I will stand by you. I will be your standing stone. I will stand by you. I will be your standing stone. I will stand by you. I will be your standing stone. I will stand by you. I will be your standing stone. I will stand by you.
And this is how I think I felt when I was nursing. I could picture me as the mother mm -hmm. if she had her at home. Mm -hmm. She'd be saying, don't cry. Yeah. Don't cry. Yeah. What I wanted to do is to be in a nurse and give back to those that need it as I received the whole 50 some years that I witnessed. Don't cry, baby. Give me a smile. Your mama will be here in a little while. Don't cry, baby. I love you so. Let's go to sleep. Let's go. Don't cry, baby. Give me a smile. Your mama will be here in a little while. Don't cry, baby. I love you so. Let's go to sleep. Let's go. To a place that's soft and sweet Lay down your sleepy head Right where the angels meet At the foot of your bed So don't cry, baby Give me a smile Your mama will be here in a little while Don't cry, baby I love you so Let's go to sleep Let's go don't cry, baby, give me a smile. Your mama will be here in a little while. Don't cry, baby, I love you so. Let's go to sleep, let's go. There's a place that's safe and warm. rock a by baby, bye. Soon you'll be in mama's arms. So close those sleepy eyes Don't cry, baby Give me a smile Your mama will be here in a little while Don't cry, baby I love you so Let's go to sleep Let's go Don't cry, baby Give me a smile Your mama will be here in a little while Don't cry, baby I love you so, let's go to sleep, let's go, let's go to sleep, let's go, let's go to sleep, let's go. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome 
to the online Sunday service of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Sterling, Virginia. We are delighted to have you join us for worship. I am Rosalie Clave, a worship associate for UUCS. We've been listening to gathering music from this morning's worship service, which is the pre-recorded Meatville Lombard in the pulpit service from June 20th, 2021. Uh, Meadville Lombard is the birthplace of many of our UU ministers, including our former beloved minister, Reverend Anya Samler Michael. Michael. And um, Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd is a, um, a Masters of Divinity graduate of Meadville also. She's the senior minister of River Road UU congregation in Bethesda. Maryland, and she preaches on going to the well of living waters based on the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. A special musical guest in this service is Mark Miller, faculty at Drew Theological School and the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale University. U University. <clears throat> Dr. Elias Ortega, president of Meadville Lombard Theological School, is also a co-creator and presenter of the, the service. The service includes an offering to benefit Meadville Lombard Theological School. You are encouraged to consider contributing to Meadville Lombard, either by making an individual donation directly to the school following the information in the service or to contribute to the UUCS offering to benefit the school by going to the UUCS webpage and choosing the offering option. Before continuing with the worship service, I have a few other announcements to make related to UUCS. First, on the uh, governance um, side, the nominating committee has identified people to fill the two vacancies on the board of trustees. This week, the board approved Steve Dick to serve as vice president and Jack Hazerjian to serve as secretary. We thank them both for their willingness to serve. The reopening task force met last Thursday. The COVID-19 metrics seem to have just barely turned the corner for Loudoun, but we're still in a high community transmissibility state. Being hopeful for continued decline in the numbers, we agreed to begin looking at opening the sanctuary for a limited seating worship service as a step toward full reopening. However, we still need to integrate the tech equipment to have it function consistently. We also need to develop a fair process for members and friends to register for the limited seats each week. Meanwhile, UUCS's facility is still open for small groups and meetings. We'll keep you informed as we progress. Now, we have a number of, of uh, social opportunities that will um, that are occurring today and in coming days. The RE program is hosting a sidewalk chalk event this morning after the service at 1130. So get ready to draw. It's with sadness that I tell you that Albert Puccio will be leaving UUCS to move back to his family in Houston. Please join us on Sunday, September 26, immediately after the service for a going away picnic to say goodbye and to send Albert off uh, with our good wishes. We have reversed, reserved Pavilion 1 at Claude Moore Park. Because of COVID, the picnic will not be a potluck. Please bring your own food. For the online YouTube watch party on October 2nd, please email your refreshment order uh, this week. Look for the menu, the email 
link and other party details in last night's eBlast message. Refreshments can be picked up curbside at UUCS on October 2nd. If you are interested in joining a covenant group, please let Reverend Aileen know so she can figure out whether to place you in an existing covenant group or whether to put you in a new one. Sharon Koviak is considering facilitating a small group using the Soul Matters curriculum starting point for those who are new to UU and or who wish to learn a general knowledge of UU history and theology. Let Reverend Aileen know if you are interested. There is interest in forming a men's spirituality group using gatherings curriculum. Also, please let Reverend Aileen know if you are interested in this. After the service, please join UUCS for online fellowship. The link to coffee hour is in the order of service. Now, let us continue with this morning's worship, the Meadville Lombard in the pulpit service, Living Water. Across the distance from the safety of our homes, we have gathered at this time to weave the strands of our lives into the tapestry of a sacred community. I am Dr. Elias Ortega, president of Midville Lombard Theological School. On behalf of Midville Lombard Theological School Extended Community, Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd, Senior Minister of River Road Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Bethesda, Maryland, and Professor Mark Miller from Drew University Theological School, we invite you to worship. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey, we invite you to take a pause, rest, and drink deeply from the well of good news of the living tradition. Let us worship together. We light this chalice as a reminder that we encounter the holy known by many names in familiar and unfamiliar places. In the light of this flame, we affirm the power of flowing, life-sustaining waters of the spirit of life to inspire in each one of us a desire to live justly and move with compassion.
Our story today for the time of all ages is called Ready to Rumble. When my friends Nancy and Mark, when we sat together to plan this service, it's kind of like when anybody is sitting down, right, to make anything. We started sharing our thoughts uh, and thinking about what inspired us and what was interesting uh, for us to do as part of this service. And there was one story that interested us the most. And that story came from the Christian scriptures, from the Gospel of John. This story is about Jesus and a lady. Jesus and a lady that he had never met, and a lady that has never met Jesus. And in this story, sometimes, like it happens often, people say nice things to each other, and they come to learn about each other a little bit more. And maybe they live with a new friend. But sometimes strangers, when they start talking to each other, things don't always kind of go well and there's conflict. And sometimes the conflict gets resolved in a peaceful manner and sometimes doesn't. However, in these encounters, unlike any story, there can be good lessons to be learned. And okay, sometimes lessons can be a little boring, but sometimes lessons are really, really interesting. So when my friends uh, and I read this story, the story of Jesus and the lady, which you will see in a minute, we see two mighty and powerful forces coming together. And in this coming together, there might be a little talking, they're also going to be a little fighting. But the important thing is that they are changing each other as often time happens in conversations and in struggling over very important ideas, we learn something new and maybe our way of understanding the world changes. In this particular story, we're gonna see a conflict between Jesus and the lady. And it all started by asking for a glass of water. In this story, my friends and I saw a battle with y'all, a big conflict between two people, two people who are really, really strong people, and not only strong people, they're also complicated folks, and neither of them wants to back down. You know this story. When there's a conflict, sometimes we feel like we might have to establish dominance, right? Like Godzilla and King Kong. We have to fight with one another to see who is going to be the king of all monsters. But just as it happened with King Kong and Godzilla, it oftentimes happens in our struggles that at the end, we may find out that we are stronger if we work together instead of against each other. Or we may have a conflict because we feel entitled to something, that the world owes something, and that we want it badly. Think about Killmonger and his fight with his cousin T'Challa. You know, I think we can understand that life was not fair to Killmonger, and that maybe he has a point, right, that things would have worked differently if he would have been accepted and known as family from the beginning. But maybe things could have also worked out better if Killmonger accepted the invitation to be family with T'Challa instead of trying to rule. We can also think about all the battles that Wonder Woman has fought. She was hardly ever taken seriously because she was seen and discounted as a woman. And of course, that makes sense. We are still fighting against the legacy of patriarchy in our society that thinks less and devalues women and gender non-conforming people. So we have to keep struggling and fighting to make justice a reality. We can also think about playground games that we oftentimes turn into a big rumble, like an exciting game of tug of war, right? We do a lot of pulling and sometimes we give a little bit so that we can breathe a little bit to then pull again some more, but we keep pulling and pulling with one hope that we will drag the other team across that line. Now, this is a line that we drew in the dirt ourselves. 
it is a meaningless line, if we are honest, but it is a line that we think it matters and we're willing to fight for that line. The sermon that Reverend Nancy will share with us today is based in one of such stories, Jesus and the Lady, the Samaritan woman. They have an interesting talk of war going on about whether or not she will give Jesus water and whether or not there's going to be a place where they both can agree that they can worship. So pay close attention to the story because there will be a moment when you will know they are going to get ready to rumble. Jesus and the woman will rumble. So are you ready to rumble? There is a story I know about two people who go head to head, toe to toe, who dip and parry and sway and meet each other with as much force as any bull who ever blundered through a china shop. It's a story from the Christian scriptures that sometimes people tell all together too nicely because it's a powerful exchange that happens in this story. And maybe it's a little intimidating any time two people who are not editing away the rough edges or the true words come together in authentic conversation. Two people who thirst for deeper truths or maybe just for a drink of water and who together resist the temptation to believe that they will surely thirst forever. In the words of the great poet, Denise Levertov, don't say, don't say there is no water to solace the dryness in our hearts. I have seen the fountain springing out of the rock wall and you drinking there and I too, before your eyes, found footholds and climbed to drink that cool water, the woman of that place shading her eyes frowned as she watched, not because she grudged the water, only because she was waiting to see that we drank our fill and were refreshed. Don't say, don't say there is no water, the fountain is there. Among scalloped gray and green stones, it is still there and always there with its quiet song and strange power to spring in us up and through the rock. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and came back once more to Galilee. Now he, had gone th- now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sakar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. 
if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his son and his livestock? Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband. You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is come and has come now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Woman, believe me, says Jesus. I say right now that I am thirsty, but you have a cup, and the wisdom you seek is right here in my own heart. Believe me, he says, that we will thirst forever. But for the drink you give to me and the truth I offer, I tell you what, he says, we need each other. And yet so often, so often when we too thirst for truth, so often when we too thirst for righteousness that can only be found in community, the story ends before it even begins. And all of us who really do thirst, the lonely ones, the ones who have all the water in the world but cannot quench alone our hope for deeper connection. We sit at the edge of the water and pine for so much as a drop. We yearn for an authentic encounter with something larger than ourselves, all while forgetting that it was ever even possible for us to pray. We cannot touch the living water of spiritual depth because the one shilling it comes so often with certitude instead of actual depth and mutual need. And today, right now, let us begin our time of prayer together by admitting that every single one of us thirsts as if in a desert at times we thirst, not just for answers, not just for truth with a capital T, but also for the spiritual depth that connects us to ourselves, to one another, and to the holy. Every single one of us. We who meet this world with certainty, and we who meet each other only with more questions, those who wonder in a wilderness we did not create, and those who live in wonder of the glory all around us. Let us begin our time of prayer by admitting that we too thirst for greater depth, for greater connection, for greater hope than we could ever find alone. We who are thirsty for deeper truths, 
We meet one another in a common yearning. We take the risk to pray even when we do not know how. We who thirst for connection, for peace. We spill out the words of our own healing, our uncertain, powerful prayer as living water to quench the parched landscape of our own souls.
that you're hurt And I pray That this works May this prayer, for and from those who do not pray, serve as a blessing, an affirmation of the unbidden words of hope and fear that bubble up from the well of our own hearts, the words and the sounds that cry out our deepest sufferings and our brightest joys. They're never gonna be perfect. They may often be nonsensical but they will always, always be authentic. With gratitude for this word we have heard, we offer commitment right now to turn every single prayer from a sword into a plowshare, transforming what was once a weapon into an implement of life and hope, beginning here, beginning now. Amen. Hasn't this been grand? It is so good to be together. We're from many places and in many ways much farther than if we had come together in person. So that is a blessing. And the story, the story this morning that was told with new eyes, with fresh eyes for us and for our children. And the swords into plowshares blessing touched my heart, I know it did yours and speaking the truth of blessing to people who may feel they have never been blessed and that a possibility occurs from us. What a wonderful gift that is. I'm here to introduce the offering. If you've been connected to Meadville, you know how important these gifts are to keep Meadville strong, to keep its program strong, to keep our faith tradition strong as the ministers trained here go out into the churches and into the communities in many ways of service. If you have never thought about where ministers come from in the Unitarian Universalist tradition, this is a good time to connect with that, to realize that it relies on school, we rely on schools like these and on gifts to these schools to carry them forward and to carry our students forward into the future. So I ask you to give generously. The words of the poet, don't say, don't say, there is no water. It is still there and always there with its quiet song and strange power to spring in us, up and out through the rock. We've come through hard times it is easy to feel parched and a little out of place in this new life together. But today we recommit to all that Meadville means and ask you to be recommitted or committed for the first time in generosity to our school. We have been greatly blessed. Let us now give generously that others might be blessed by the work of our beloved school, Meadville. Thank you. Amen. 
midst of pain, I choose love. In the midst of pain, I choose love. Water Sign Woman by Lucille Clifton. The woman who feels everything sits in her new house, waiting for someone to come who knows how to carry water without spilling it, who knows why the desert is sprinkled with salt, why tomorrow is such a long and ominous word. They say, to the feel things woman that little she dreams of is possible. That there is only so much joy to go around so much water. There are no questions for this, no arguments. She has to forget to remember the edge of the sea, they say. To forget how to swim to the edge, she has to forget how to feel. The woman who feels everything sits in her new house, retaining the secret the desert knew when it walked up from the ocean. The desert so beautiful in her eyes. Water will come again if you can wait for it. She feels what the desert feels. She waits.
A traveler is far, far away from home. He is in the midst of a long journey, and he is tired. There are all those people to baptize, you know? More than anybody else, people are saying so. He's baptizing more people even than his cousin John. Things are happening for Jesus. It's an adventure, this journey he's on. One might even say a grand plan is underway. And yet, in this moment, where the story meets him, the man is hungry and he is thirsty. So while his friends are apparently off in town getting lunch, he waits there in the shade of a fountain. Thirsty as he is, he just sits there and waits. Just waits, I guess. Just waits until the story says that a woman comes along to that place near the well, minding her own business by all accounts. It seems going about the day that is set out in front of her, carrying the water, chopping the wood, literally. As those including women whose power is often marginalized do nonetheless then and now, carry the water, chop the wood, do the work. And so she comes along, doing the work, and he waits there, right by the water, thirsty as he is, he waits there until she arrives, and then, as if it were completely impossible to do a single thing himself, he asks this overburdened, busy woman if she will hurry up and get him a drink. Not only that, he gives her grief. When she asks perfectly reasonable questions in return, like, who are you to ask me for a drink? I mean, after all, a Samaritan woman is not supposed to be cavorting with some strange man in the shade of a well all alone. The patriarchy has its rules, doesn't it? And let's face it, we all know who pays the price when those rules get broken. And I can't help but thinking, in this exchange that is literally the single longest dialogue between Jesus and anybody contained anywhere within the Christian scriptures, I cannot help but think when I hear that story that Jesus in this scenario is, well, kind of a jerk, right? But there he is. This rather obnoxious Jesus who starts up a conversation only to realize that this person he has met in the desert is not going to take a punch without throwing one right back. Who are you to ask me that, she says in return, and why exactly do you seem to know my business? What are you talking about with this living water you say you're going to give to me? You want to ask me questions, the Samaritan woman seems to say. I will be asking a few right back. And I love it. I love this dialogue so much. I love him. I love her. I love the characters who meet each other in this place. I cannot tell you. The socially awkward savior who forgot to bring a cup. This conversation partner who is already carrying one bucket of water too many, yet thirsts for something deeper than the well alone can give. Some meaning beyond even the scope of the temple and the priests and the patriarchy and the prophets all around her. They meet each other. And so it goes. These two facing off. In an exchange that, like every real conversation, includes some actual tension and exudes some mutually exerted power and ultimately leaves both parties changed at the end. This is literally the only time that Jesus is not dancing inspirational solos around every single character in the Christian scriptures. It happens right here in the mundane, beautiful place in the shadow of a well when a person he was never supposed to even talk to gave as much as she got. For once, the Savior doesn't just throw down truth bombs, drop the mic, and proceed onward into the next phase of the gospel story. For once, he stays in it. 
because there are things to say when both parties come to a conversation willing to engage something real. In this remarkable moment, Jesus not only interrogates this woman about what it is her whole soul thirsts for, he abides in it just long enough for her to interrogate him right back. And the wonder of it all, the waiting miracle beneath the densest of theological readings, to me the wonder of it all is simply this, that both of them came to that well thirsting body and soul, both admitted they were in need of something that only the other could provide, and by the sheer discomfort and authentic exchange of a conversation, both came away transformed. Would that such creative interchange, such true and dangerous and beautiful give and take, such tension and honesty and willingness to be transformed were the norm rather than the exception in both society and scripture alike. Because good God, aren't there already enough monologues in this world? Monologues, from the pulpit, where preachers declare things. Monologues dropped into the void of social media where everybody's got to be persuading an abstract somebody of something. Monologues crafted by PR people to communicate the finely tuned, image conscious, brand tested messages of the machine. Monologues in scripture that stand in for whatever spiritual, political, or social agendas the person holding the pen wanted to get across. There are so many monologues all around us. So few real dialogues. And I understand why. Because, of course, the stakes of a dialogue of a real conversation, the stakes of a real conversation are so much higher than a monologue. The risks are inherently greater. As the great theologian James Cone reminds us, dialogue does not truly happen unless both parties are affected. It doesn't happen unless something changes in all of us. And if congregational life, the spiritual journey, and the life of God are to be anything other than yet one more submission into the world's tedious anthology of self-righteous monologues, the central requirement is a willingness to be changed by the holy other who parries back and forth alongside you. And they do parry these two about who worships at the temple in Jerusalem and who worships somewhere else. There's backstory to that whole thing. The Samaritans being essentially rogue Israelites who didn't worship at Solomon's temple, but instead on the heights of their own sacred mountain in what is now smack dab in the middle of the West Bank. They had different sacred places, these two. This woman and this man in conversation by a well and that, just that, the fact that they had different sacred places along, along with gender and kyriarchy and all the things, that was why they weren't supposed to be talking to each other in the first place. That right there was the crux of an ages-old enmity between the Samaritans and the Israelites. Their temples were not on the same piece of real estate. And yet in this dialogue, what we encounter in these two characters is not just a debate about whose temple is more sacred. Instead, it is an invitation to turn from the hope that the temple will save you in the first place. No matter what patch of land that temple occupies, turn from the hope that one single sacred place or one single sacred idea or one pure and sacred thought you came up with yourself will save you from the death-dealing alienation that leaves you still thirsting for a better and more connected world. Turn from the hope that the temple will save you because the living water of actual human interchange does not dwell even in the most beautiful of edifices. And God knows, 
in this strange and unforgettable time. We have learned that lesson together. When the temples and the edifices and the buildings we love have been closed to us, we have met each other still. We have met each other in stranger, different places, through these screens and along paths, screaming with the music of the natural world, in lawn chairs and on back decks. We left the temple behind us and came to the places where we can still find each other, yes, even in the midst of the desert of our own desolation. At the edge of the town well, we have met each other. Outside the little downtown coffee shop, perhaps in time once again by the cookie table in the fellowship hall on Sunday morning, we will meet each other. In this time, we have met every place where two or more are gathered is a sacred space wherever the people find each other. And thus our task in this moment on this journey is not just to return to our separate sacred temples and close the doors again. No, our task is to continue making space for the living water of actual transformative interchange to flow wherever and whenever it can. Salvation does not come from doing reverent things in anointed places. It comes from the encounters we have with one another and with the holy, the dialogue that always leads us to become something new. Dear blessed creator, dear mother, dear savior, dear father, dear brother, dear holy other, so sings Spencer LaJoy in the prayer of our hearts this morning. Dear holy other, Dear sibling, dear baby, dear patiently waiting, dear sad and confused, dear stuck and abused, dear end of your rope, dear worn down and broke, dear go it alone, dear running from home, dear righteously angry, forsaken by family, dear jaded and quiet, dear tough and defiant, I pray that I'm heard and I pray that this works. I pray if a prayer has been used as a sword against you and your heart, against you and your work, word, I pray that this prayer is a plowshare of sorts, that it might break you open, that it might help you grow. And in this way, no worthwhile prayer leaves us unchanged, because no worthwhile prayer is a monologue a declaration of what you want or what you believe or what you lament. Instead, it is a dialogue of sorts, lifted up to the holy, the holy other who beckons in all of their sacred forms, one of which are the people sitting right next to you or through this screen in relationship to you this morning. The living water for which we thirst It is relationship itself. It is the listening that turns us into something new. It is the courage to keep on becoming because we actually impact one another. And that is the purpose of the church. In whatever place we find it in or out of the temple by the side of of the well, it is a place where all of us get to keep becoming something new. When all of us are in relationship to something other than ourselves that grounds us in the courage to be transformed. It is a dialogue that never ends and that isn't always fun in which sometimes we're jerks, and sometimes we're confused, and sometimes we're tired, and often we're tempted to drop the mic and make our point and head off into our own stories self-righteously as we came. But maybe, maybe, we too have the courage to stay there by the well and keep talking until our thirst is quenched and our journey goes on, altered forever by the holy other we encountered as we widen the circle for just one more.
church family, let's sing together. Yes, that one. Drink it in. Let it fill you. Come. Come to the water. Amen. Ashe. Blessed, blessed be.